Podtacular, the unofficial Halo Universe podcast presents episode 495, New Blood Discussion, recorded live on July 21st, 2015. Hello everyone, welcome to Pod Tackler, the unofficial Halo Universe podcast. I'm your host, Dust Storm. And I'm your co-host, Godzilla T. We are here talking about New Blood tonight. We're taking a little bit of a different turn away from the barrage of Halo news as of late from all the conventions. We have a, a little break from between E3 and San Diego Comic-Con to talk about some lore stuff regarding Halo. Uh, although we are going to go right back into it with RTX coming up in just two weeks, which I can't believe it's only two weeks away until then. That's crazy. There's a lot of stuff to do between now and then. And then there is PAX Prime shortly after that. So we have some other big conventions coming up, for us at least. And we're just taking a break for this week. We're going to be talking about New Blood tonight which is uh, we're actually recording this on Tuesday compared to our normal Thursday because our Thursday podcast, we're going to be talking about some controversial topics regarding Halo 5. So the whole thing where there's no split screen, doing the whole rec packs for Warzone, and a few other things that have been brought up recently amongst media, communities, all that stuff. So we're going to talk about that on Thursday and get through some submissions, which we've neglected for the last two months or so. So we're going to be doing that on Thursday. But uh, New Blood is the first Halo novel that was actually a digital-only novel. It was pretty short. I guess it's technically a novelette, I think is what they called it. But it goes through the origin story of Sergeant Edward Buck, or at least kind of as we knew him from Halo 3 ODST as Sergeant Edward Buck. And this is kind of how he becomes a Spartan 4. So we already have a good introduction to him through Halo 3 ODST, but this kind of goes back even further to when he first became an ODST, and then it kind of ends up with him becoming a Spartan 4. So this is probably a good shorter story to read up on if you want to get into the characters for Halo 5. And there's going to be a few other books that you want to pay attention to. Hunters in the Dark. Wow, I wish I had the infographic up right now. Um, where are the other, next two books i'm drawing a blank now ah, gosh i feel so bad i'm sorry i'm feeling everyone on this podcast right now but hunters in the dark wasn't last light was it yeah last light's one of them and then there was a there was one more book coming down the pipeline that's going to be related to or, or something that's going to be very in, integral into halo 5 uh I, okay i have the infographic now so it's uh Last Light, which is the exploration of the blue team. Hunters in the Dark, which is the introduction to Olympia Vale. Uh, New Blood, of course, is for Buck. And that's about it from the books that are currently coming out. As far as some of the other fiction that plays into it. So this is, I don't have this graphic up on the stream right now, but they showed this during the San Diego Comic Con panel for Halo 5. And it basically shows how all the fiction ties into Halo 5 Guardians. So in addition to those books, we're going to see um, Escalation plays into the introduction of Tanaka and some other blue team stuff. The Fall of Reach animated series obviously plays off of the Fall of Reach novel, if you haven't read that. Of course, the Hunt the Truth audio drama plays into Halo 5 and then the Master Chief Collection and Nightfall also play into where Halo 5 is going. Master Chief Collection, because that's the Halo games before, and then Nightfall as the introduction of Agent Locke. So that's how everything breaks down into how it's going to play into Halo 5. And we're going to be talking about New Blood tonight, which is probably the most interesting backstory I think we'll get, because everyone loves Buck. Everyone absolutely fell in love with him when Halo 3 ODST came out. And he, I mean, it's voiced by Nathan Fillion. So you have a plus on that. And everyone loves Nathan Fillion, it seems like. Well, if uh, it would have been anybody else, I don't think people would have fallen in love with Buck the way they have. No, I don't think so. I mean, Nathan really made Buck happen. It just, the attitude he gave him, it just, it fit. And it, you know, people just love the way Buck 
handles things. And if anybody else had voiced him, I, you know, I don't think Buck would be where he is today. I would agree with that. And I would say it's Buck is more Nathan Fillion than Nathan Fillion is Buck because Bungie originally created the character around Nathan Fillion. Mm -hmm. So in essence, it's just kind of an extension of Nathan Fillion into Buck. True. At least that's kind of the way I see it or perceive it. I, the one thing I, I do wish they would have done is had Nathan Fillion read the book. Don't get me wrong. The gentleman that did read the book did a fairly decent job, but it just wasn't the same. Luckily, I have a good imagination. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That is the question we actually did ask Matt Forbeck regarding the audiobook, but we'll have that interview out here pretty shortly. I don't want to spoil too much in there because there's actually a lot of good audio tidbits in there. Which I want I want people to go listen to it. It's a great interview. There is kind of one context point that I needed to get authorized from 343 before releasing it. So it's going to be coming out after I can get that okay from them. But other than that, it's I mean, it's a pretty good interview. We got to sit down with him for 30 minutes and talk. It was it was a lot of fun. I'm really looking forward to that one. Yeah. It's it's going to be one for for people to look out for. I think it's going to be one everyone will enjoy. So, let's kind of dig into the book a little bit here. It was for me, I had to read it twice in order to get the full picture of it because just how the book jumps around between all the different stories and how Buck tells it is just so so off the wall. It It is definitely one of those books that you have to go through multiple times to actually get the whole story out of the book just because of the way it's told, because he jumps around so much that you can almost lose track of where he is in his story. Yeah. I don't know if that was something that I particularly agreed with in the style. And honestly, to me, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what Buck's personality is supposed to be, but that just seemed a lot more annoying than an expression of who Buck is from a narrative standpoint. I'm, I'm thinking that's just me because it was hard to keep track of the thought, the, the way they're trying to bring across the thought process of thought processes of Buck. It does seem to fit the character to me. I mean, you've got him telling, you know, starting off by telling the story of where he is and it reminds him of, you know, where, well, I'm sorry. It reminds him of where he, where this, where another tight spot was and to get the full effect of, you know, why that is important. He needs to tell this other story of why, you know, that to just to get the, you know, the story straight. Yeah. And why one means so much to the other, you kind of have to jump around and yes, it is hard to follow, but by the second time I went through the book, I pretty much got the, you know, the layout where, you know, I could keep up with, okay, well, this belongs here and okay, this is why he's telling us this. And so right. it started to make a lot more sense the second time through than it did the first time. The first time I did really have a hard time keeping up with what the story was, what they were trying to tell in the story. And for me, it was one of those things that even after my second read, I understood the entirety of the information that I was supposed to get, but I still didn't understand the timeline. And it was only until reading the synopsis before recording this podcast tonight, where I finally see the timeline of when something was said and how it kind of fit into where he was at then. Cause the book actually starts out with, uh, and I'm just going to preface this. Now, this is going to be spoiler territory for the entire podcast. So if you haven't read the book, Stop now. Come back and listen to it when you have. There. there. There's the spoiler declaration. But the book starts off where Mickey betrays Buck and Romeo. And that, that's where the book picks up. And by the time you get to the end of the book, I think probably the last chapter, you finally come back there. So I think for the most part, this was kind of like him debriefing this incident. And I'm not exactly sure to whom he's debriefing it, but he starts at this point in this particular mission to rescue Sadie and uh, the superintendent. Virgil. Right. 
Virgil. Yeah. Quick to quick to adjust. Yeah, I stick with Virgil. Yeah, that works. It's all all the, it's all the same entity, so to speak. Of uh, going to rescue them, and then he goes back. I don't know. It's like he goes back to the beginning, and then he goes forward a certain part and then he goes back again then he goes forward a certain ways and then he goes back again then he finally catches up and that was just it was really hard to keep track of how many times like what what pieces belong to which part of the story Mm -hmm. yeah it's well you know right at the beginning they they start the story out they get dropped off on this planet to go rescue virgil and sadie and i love how they they captured Romeo and Mickey in this story as well. You know, I know the story is not about them, but they did a really good job of capturing Romeo and Mickey's personalities in the, in the text as well. You know, Romeo's that just that smart ass that you just want to smack. Yep. But Mickey's got that same, you know, has got that same streak in him. It's just not as, he's just usually not as vocal as Romeo. The drop the pelican drops them off, and you know immediately Romeo is bitching that they have to walk. Which I mean, they're in power assisted armor. How hard can it be? But anyway, they get to you know they get to their point point where they're you know they're overlooking the the any base where Virgil and Sadie are being held, and of course you know he f- feels the muzzle of a gun against his head, and you know there's some other stuff that they go through there just basically describing the scene of what he's looking at and stuff like that. And then at that moment, he thinks of, he starts to tell of us, tell us of another really tight spot that he was in. Cause you know, right now he's there, you have Buck, Romeo and Mickey, and they're surrounded by insurrectionists. Betrayed by Mickey. Well, at this point, at this point, I don't think they've actually said that yet. No, but I mean, later on at the end of the book, you know, that, you know that Mickey is the one that's sticking the rifle against Buck's back. But then, you know, he's, he starts reminiscing about his, a similar problematic mission on Draco three, mm-hmm. where, you know, they're chasing this insurrectionist leader and they're holed up in basically a par- parliament building. And you get the, he sends the rookie off to do a flanking maneuver Unfortunately, the, the rookie gets caught and they're holding the rookie hostage. And at that time, you get a, he gets a radio call from Spartan Sarah Palmer. And at this point, there's another flashback. <laughs> and then, then you step back even further. And this is where you really start to hear about Buck's backstory, about what he was before, before the events of ODST. Right. The quote original Alpha 9 team. And the first time that he met up with Sarah Palmer and how he was on a secret Oni mission uh, that was his handler was uh, Veronica Dare. They talk a little bit about the mission and then they step back again and they start talking about how Buck and Veronica Dare met. It's uh, quite, it's quite the interesting, uh, sequence of events and this is how the whole book goes he steps you know he's made four steps back now to explain the thing that he started the book with so anybody that's has read the book read it again because you're going to find new stuff like i said i've listened to the book twice and i do do audiobooks because i do this on my drive back and forth to work and both times i found new stuff i'm gonna start listening to it again because and i know i'll find new stuff but start describing how how Veronica and him met at a resort planet. Uh, what was the name of it? Castellaneta. Castellaneta. Yeah, the one from Hunt the Truth. Yep. And how they had the you know this this two weeks of just absolute bliss. They were just enjoying each other's company, and they're on the last night. That's when he figures out that she's a spook. Dun dun dun. Uh, yeah, and that kind of gets you up to date on the relationship to ODST. Sorta. Right, uh, it does a pretty good job. Yeah, the whole conversation that they have, you know, when he comes out of the drop pod, that little bit made that scene make a whole lot more sense. And even another part of the story after they he jumps ahead after talking with 
or hooking up with their on his shore leave. There was another instance where he was under another mission that was under there. This is the one mm-hmm. that caused the flashback in the first place where he was actually given a order. Uh, there was another team of ODSTs in this uh, mission that was on Draco three that was supposed to be a diversion while Buck and his alpha nine team went in to Lethbridge to retrieve information that they didn't want to fall into the hand of the covenant. Pull that well, information. That, that's actually a different mission than the one that you're talking about. The one on Draco three is that is where Sarah Palmer was a Spartan and cause that's where uh, Buck is from is Draco three. He left before, uh, obviously before the covenant glass to planet. And he goes into detail on that and how the covenant. Yes, they did take over the planet, but they didn't glass it. They actually left the planet mostly untouched and they basically used it for a hunting preserve and they would hunt humans. Uh, the mission you're talking about was Gamma 6. And that's why this is so confusing to keep track of. <laughs> right. <laughs> I had to cheat and look. But that that one is where... All right. You know, they get done t- talking about Veronica, and then they go back to Draco 3, and Buck is talking to this insurrectionist leader, you know, trying to talk her down, you know, so she won't kill the rookie. Then she, he gets the call from Spartan Palmer that they're on the ground ready to back him up. And then they jump back to the Gamma six encounter, which was, it wasn't the first time that he'd met Sarah Palmer, but it was, you know, it'd been a, been a few years or if I remember correctly, anyway, alpha nine was sent in to retrieve sensitive information from a left bridge industrial Facility complex, yeah, Phyllis facility, of course, funded by Oni. Can you imagine that? And Sarah Palmer's ODST group was sent there as a distraction. Well, let's see, did they jump out of that? I can't remember. Anyway, on Gamma 6, they're assigned with going to retrieve this data chip. They go in, they retrieve the data chip, and on their way out, they find out that Sarah Palmer's group is in trouble. Mm-hmm. The Covenant have all but wiped out her team. While they're en route to go help her, she calls out on the radio, I'm the only one left, and I'm out of ammo. And Oni being Oni says, no, you will get to your drop point. And they're talking to Buck at this point. You will get to your drop point and get that information, You know, get that data chip out of there. It cannot fall into enemy hands. Buck being Buck says, we don't leave ODST, we don't leave Marines behind. And they go to rescue him, and he basically tells Veronica, if you want your chip, you better send the dropship here. Yeah, he had all the power there. (laughs) Yeah, he pulled a, I don't report to you move as well. He said you could take it up with my XO when we get back. Because technically, ODSTs serve under the UNSC, not ONI. Correct. They were on loan. Right. And of course, he was still bitter about the kind of relation or the learning the fact that she was a spook right and that's what bothered him so much is because buck really fell hell over heels in love with her in that two weeks and to find out that she was an only spook it's like mixing oil and water it just doesn't work there's a line in there too that was very potent i think and it was at the very end before they left where buck said that she wasn't anything that he expected after learning that she was and then she said well you were exactly what i what i expected out of you way to bring a man down yeah right? and i think she even if i remember right she even warned him it's like you don't want to know what i do yeah he asked anyways yeah she did tell him don't go she basically said don't go there you right won't like what you find and buck being buck just you know he had to push being a stubborn head i think anyone at that point is if you get that crazy and then just two weeks time or, or a week or however long it is, I mean, you're going to be curious as to what someone does, especially if in being in the military, if they want to hook up again, you kind of need to know where to look for them. Right. Well, I think it was more, she knew about him, but he didn't know about her type deal. Yeah. You know, it's, 
Buck is one of those guys that ask questions and he usually tends to ask the uncomfortable questions. And the way I kind of looked at it, Oni sent Dare there to keep an eye on Buck for whatever reason. It was a planned meet that maybe yeah. she didn't directly know. Well, it was planned by somebody. Just we were not exactly yeah. sure who. But a anyway, compatibility plan. It was just interesting the way they did that, and the fact, and I could see, I can see it happening with those two, with the way, the way they portrayed their personalities. I could see that happening just the way they described it in the book. Even before I read the book, that's kind of the way I figured it went down. You know, they had this great great time and all of a sudden wait a minute you're a what which is the polar opposite of what buck is the you know the stuff that she's been trained to do and the stuff that she does do are almost the complete opposite of buck's moral compass and you see that in the book and this incident on gamma six is a prime example of it She's telling him to get the information out of here. And he's saying, we'll get the information out of here when we can bring all the ODSTs with us. Lots of drama. Yeah, lots of drama. Uh, looking at the chapter again, actually, believe, believe it or not, I remembered exactly where it was. I think that chapter five and just seeing the events take place, you can just see that Buck is just kind of biting away at trying to figure out who she really is. And then she basically says you don't want to go there and he keeps digging and then he eventually finds out on his own that she's a spook yeah he figures it out <laughs> and she's like should have shouldn't have let you got that close to figure that out and then he goes on to a whole thing is like am i was that your mission in the first place have you lied to me at all and, and she's like no it what why i'm here has nothing to do with you the last lines of those chapter is him basically saying that she took him by surprise and for her she said you didn't surprise me at all well of course she didn't because she read his dossier before she showed up i want to know why why she wanted to meet him or why well only I, wanted them to meet because i think the reason is is because they were looking at, to use him as an operative well not an operative but you know use him in the in the way that they did to put him on oni missions they were like vetting him to make so sure to get that him emotionally trapped into doing this stuff because of his emotional connection. I don't know that it was, I don't know that it was actually that. I mean, I'm sure that plays into it a little bit. Cause for me, if some I, girl screws me over like that, there ain't no way in hell I'm going to go out of my way to do her dirty work. Well, after this little incident incident, it was years before, Buck and Veronica talked again. True, right. but you, you, I mean, she still burned you. True, but you also have to remember that in that little short period of time they were together, Buck really did fall in love with her. And she actually fell in love with him. And that's where the twist is. Because if she'd have just been there and done her job, Buck wouldn't have got close enough to figure out that she was Oni. Her emotions got in the way of her doing her job. And that's how he figured out that she was part of Oni. Or that she was an only operative. And that's what she's saying when she says, I shouldn't have let you get this close. Exactly. The feelings are there. Even if somebody screws you over that hard, if you love them to this extent, which it's obvious by the time you get to the end of the book, that how deeply they do care for each other, you're willing to give them another shot. You're willing to give them multiple shots. It gives you an opportunity to spend time with this person. And I think Buck really actually enjoyed enjoyed being a thorn in her side as, yeah. as maybe a little retribution. Well, in the beginning of the next chapter, he says that he tried to like catch up with her. He managed to like track her down through UNSC channels and try to contact her, but she would ignore him every time. And it wasn't until mm -hmm. a few years later for the Lethbridge mission on Sargasso that he ever heard from her again. Mm-hmm. And he said at that point, I don't even think our paths would have crossed if she wasn't the agent leading that mission. I think that being we're talking about Oni was a planned deal. I think Oni had his unit in mind because, you know, they built up this service record of surviving all these 
different campaigns and you know all these different drops that Oni's looking at his team and they know they you know they know what's happening between him and Veronica. Oh yeah, they do. And I think they just use that as a ploy to make sure that he they think well, I think what they think is that she can keep him under control and get the job done. Well, I'm wondering for her from her perspective if it was something that she was hesitant to even do because of the past relationship or if it was something that she was on board with and then when Buck found out he's like, "Oh, this is really happening." kind of thing. Yeah, it's it's kind of tough to figure out which way to take that one. Right. Cuz I mean, you from the previous statement, Veronica has been actively avoiding him. Probably for a good reason. For you know, granted that she could have been undercover or whatever doing her job. Well, and you have to think being an Oni person that there's a lot of things going on that if it comes to like after I'm sure that she knew a lot about him already going into or like when they first met, it was probably like the day after they first met, she was looking up Oni channels of who this guy was kind of thing. I I honestly think she knew who he was, who he was before she even got to the planet. Yeah, I, I, li- I, I literally I just don't think knowing that she would fall in love with him the way yeah. she did. I think Oni sent her there for Buck, either but to she, evaluate him. So she said, or according to the, the quotes in the book, she said that her mission had nothing to do with him and that she did not lie to him once. Oh, yeah, I forgot. I honestly I, don't think that it was something that was, t- in her mind, intentional. Maybe Oni had some kind of agenda for it, but I honestly don't think she had the intention of trying to hook up with Buck. It just it was something that happened. And then being Oni, she would be yeah. the kind of person that after that first night of them getting close, it's like, okay, I need to look up this guy to make sure that this isn't something I need to escape from quickly or something that's going to jeopardize me. I want to make sure he's, he's a legit ODST. Right. And I think that's the point where at the very end of that chapter, where we see, her saying that Buck is exactly what she was expecting, looking at like background background profiles, psychiatric profiles, personality profiles, all that kind of stuff that Oni would have on soldiers in the UNSC. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it basically you're you're basically reading someone for what they've been documented for throughout all their military career. So of course she's going to know exactly what he's going to react to and reading up on all that, she is going to know exactly who he is. Well, I don't think Buck is exactly one of those hard people to read because like three minutes into the opening cutscene to ODST, I had a pretty good idea of what, Buck, who Buck was and what kind of ag- attitude he had. And he lived up to it throughout the whole campaign. That he did. Yeah. I, I do agree with you. I'm sure she did all the research after she met him. Yeah. I, for, I totally forgot about that line. Of her being there for something else. And we never know what specifically. Of course not. It was Oni. Right. It's classified. I mean, heck, for all we know, she could have been ordered to take shore leave as well. One fiery romance. <laughs> yeah. But going back to, I guess, the Lethbridge story, they basically had the, the whole data extraction and then going to help Sarah Palmer, who was an ODST at the time. And it's kind of interesting to me that Sarah Palmer is still kind of permeating throughout the rest of the Halo lore. And I know a lot of people will give a lot of flack for Sarah Palmer, but I think given the Halo universe, she's a good character to include in all of this kind of stuff. Well, definitely. I think from the perspective of the Halo universe, Palmer is actually a well-fleshed out character to have. So to me, I, I kind of enjoy seeing her in other parts of the Halo fiction. Yeah, I enjoyed Sarah Palmer in Halo 4. Granted, she was a pretty rough character, but I I saw the potential and I really enjoyed the uh, really enjoyed her character in Halo 4 and then in the Spartan Ops and then later on in the comics. A lot of people don't like Sarah Palmer and that's fine. That's your opinion. Me personally, I like the character. Could have they could they have done better with her? Yes, they could have fleshed her out a lot better in Halo Four and not made her seem so much like you know the wise ass soldier that knew everything. 
but overall, you know, I've enjoyed her character and, you know, now that we've basically lived with her for a little while and they've worked on, you know, telling a little bit more about her and her backstory and stuff like that. I think she's, they've done really well with her character and she fits in into this story very well. She yeah. fits in here very well, but it's, I just, I really love this book. This is a very good book. Mm -hmm. I wish they'd have done this with nightfall. <laughs> Honestly, they would have made nightfall this book. Don't get me wrong. I still want this book for just getting an old book buck. But if they'd have done this for nightfall, everybody right. would have a totally different outlook on Spartan lock, but back to this one. I mean, so on the Palmer point, I was kind of, they kind of gave us a little insight to who Palmer was as a trooper pre Spartan four program. I feel like Palmer is one of those characters that, like you said, they, they've fleshed out over time, but having this kind of story, even though it's small about her, kind of garners me to respect her as a character a little bit more than I did in Halo 4. And I don't hate her from Halo 4 like a lot of people seem to, or even the comics, but I really I really liked this little short blurb about her. And it's cool seeing Halo characters cross paths, even though you never knew it until this story is told. True. There is uh, a lot of good things that they did with her character and got her involved in the story in a very good way. But Buck's re here doing the Sony mission and finds out that Sarah Palmer or Sarah's group is in trouble. You know, she's basically about to die. All the rest of her team is dead. I love how they make their entrance. You have alpha nine in a semi two of them in the cab two of them on the flatbed trailer underneath tarps. And I think there were bricks under the tarps. I don't remember exactly what Something was on the Something like load. that, yeah. But anyway, the uh, I forget who was who was driving uh, Gomez or yeah, Gomez was driving, and he basically power slides this semi into the group of Covenant running over the brutes. Right? Didn't he run over like one brute or something? Like side swiped a brute. I think he ran over multiple the way they described it, but, and, you know, Buck jumps off the back and takes care of a couple of grunts, runs over to Sarah Palmer. She's picking up her comrades and he basically says, hang on. He hands her a magazines, says, we got a little work to do before we can start worrying about them. At this point, they've got a couple of Banshees coming in. They have, they have a good line in there. Uh, which one of them, Samrat, I think it was Samrat, was hiding behind a car that was actually absolutely shot to hell. And Buck calls over to him and says, you know, can you find a car with more holes in it to hide behind? <laughs> and he, he comes back to him and says, well, I figured that the, the covenant can't blow the gas up in the tank twice. Makes sense. Yeah, it's a good point. It's just, you know, there's a lot of those good one-liners in there. That's one of those instances. It's like, oh yeah, I guess he's right. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh well, sure. They, you know, they take out the two banshees. They pick up, you know, all the dead ODSTs, and you know, they exfil. The next step is they go to Veronica debriefing Alpha Nine. In other words, giving him a royal ass chewing. And Buck basically tells him, tells her that you're not my boss. Exactly. You go talk to my real boss, see what he says about it. Cause I'm pretty sure he's going to side with me. They throw in, you know, is this about our relationship and basically blow that off? No, it's not about that. Or Buck does. And they come back to Draco three for a little bit and they start describing the situation that he's in there. I think they actually go straight to the Spartan. The first time he was asked to get in the Spartan pro four program. And then they even, jump again shortly after that to the ODST uh, storyline. As much as I love this story, it jumped more than a gymnast. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. True. We talked about that for about 15 minutes before you joined up. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> the the uh... Yeah, because the beginning of Chapter 7, that's where the whole transition is. 
he's talking about how he didn't see Sarah Palmer for years after that. Uh, he had the whole debriefing with Dare and the whole thing that you just mentioned. And mm -hmm. then there's a short bit in here where he was talking about trying to keep relationships going during time of war. And then they finally like hooked up after the war. But then they talked about, so, uh, so yeah, they talked about the vacation at sundown and how he was first asked by June to take part in the Spartan four program. And then they jump back to the kind of the ODST storyline. The little conversation that he has with June is pretty good too. Oh yeah. As far as June, you'd think that pretty much any soldier would jump at the chance to become a Spartan, especially with the reputation of Spartans have built up by now. Uh huh. And June approaches Buck and Buck and Veronica are in their private cabana or whatever it is. Right. June says, you know, basically says, I want to talk to you alone. And Buck's like, well, no, you can say anything you want in front of her. She's got higher security clearance than me. And June's like, no, this conversation is between you and me. And she says, okay, I'll leave. And they have their conversation. And after Buck turns him down because he will not consider Romeo and Mickey for the program. Right. He didn't want to break up his squad. His squad meant too much to him. Well, the way he looked at it, that is part of it. And that is a big part of it. But also his squad's what made him look so good in his opinion. June basically says, no, this is why we're picking you. And it's because of your leadership skills and how you've pulled Alpha 9 through all this stuff. Buck will tune his own horn, but not when it comes to his team. Well, and June is talking about all the data points that they've collected with his combat record uh, and all that stuff. And Buck tries to make the argument that they're just as good as he is, that they're learning more than he ever has. And June comes back and says, no, they're not. And I've got the data to prove it. <laughs> you, you are the best of the squad for a reason. There is a reason you are being considered and they are not. And is after, after June actually s starts to leave, is that where he asked how many people turned him down? Yeah. And he said that yeah. he was the first, the first ever makes you feel good. <laughs> uh, to an extent, I guess <laughs> I was being sarcastic because the way June put it is how many people have had, have said no to becoming basically right. an, a national hero. So I, I took yeah. it, it, it. He says, you mean how many dedicated UNSC soldiers have declined the opportunity to become part of the next wave of super soldiers capable of securing peace throughout the galaxy? And June says, take a guess. And he says, none. <laughs> you are the first. I just love, love the way that line was delivered. Yep. So after that, we go to, where do we go, Dust? Uh, after that, I think we, I think that's when we jump to the new Mombasa story. The ODST campaign. Okay. Which he basically... Yeah, it's basically kind of verbatim what happens in the game. I think it's either a chapter or two that they cover basically all the events. And it's pretty much everything that you see in the game is what they talk about. So if, if you remember reading the Flood book, you see a lot of the stuff from the game in the book. It's similar to that, just wrapped up in a shorter summary. It's the Cliff Notes version. Pretty much. And then there was the whole bit of uh, at the at the end of the game when they're like at the end of this war, ask me again if they won't like want to get together. And eventually they do. And that's what actually leads off of their vacation at sundown. And then when he got asked to be part of the Spartan 4 program. So there's that kind of little interlude in there. So we can kind of skip that. Yeah. So that, that was when they kind of rekindled the relationship and it's like is this something that we can actually do because you, you have the first the first encounter which is when they had a great time and he learned that she was a spook then the second encounter that they talk about was when she was leading a mission the odst mission where we hear of spartan palmer being an odst and alpha and i went to go save her and then the next time you see them together is for this new mabasa mission and then the time after that is when they after the war, they finally hook up and 
take a vacation together, and that's when June approaches him about becoming a Spartan Four, and then he turns it down. Yeah, after after he turns down June, and they you know they talk about the events in ODST, they go back to Draco Three. At this point, basically, what they've done is Buck has told Mickey and Dutch to try and sneak around and get to either side of the insurrectionists up on the podium. Right. And the reason they are not shooting the insurrectionists from the lobby is because there's an energy sealed in place. Didn't, didn't they not find that out until one of them tried to shoot? Yeah. Romeo. Yeah. So he I, shot. I was and then... actually just about to get to that part, but oh, sorry. Uh, they basically, no problem. They've got, you've got Dutch and Mickey trying to flank from either side. You've got the rookie up on the balcony with this insurrectionist. They've beat the crap out of him. They've knocked his helmet off. And the insurrectionist leader is holding a gun to his head. Buck is trying to talk the rookie out of danger. The insurrectionist leader is spouting all this bull about how the UNSC is, you know, the devil and carnage and all this stuff, or the UEG. She makes a comment of, you weren't born here. You don't know everything that's gone on because of what the UNSC has done. Yeah. And Buck's like, wait a minute. I was born three blocks down the road. He starts into telling a little bit about his, his time growing up on Draco 3, which he's just basically trying to buy time for uh, the other two to get, to get into position. And during this, Romeo being Romeo, decides to take a shot at the insurrectionist leader. And that's when they discover that they have an en- energy barrier. And Buck basically looks over at, over at Romeo and, you know, you the idiot. The stare of death, basically. <laughs> yes. It's like, you moron. Why'd you do that? Buck has also, by this point, has basically taken his helmet off and is you know, talking to this leader, you know, face to face all this time, Spartan Palmer and her squad have been setting up outside, Mm -hmm. getting ready to storm the facility. Buck's just trying to buy time to see if he can save the rookie. Mickey and Dutch finally get in position. They begin to charge the balcony and Mickey is the first one in. He's got a shot on the leader but he freezes in that moment. The insurrection leader kills the rookie. Right. And then Dutch proceeds to repay the favor. So it happens when you hesitate. Well, he kills the insurrectionist leader with a shotgun, no less. I think a couple of the other guys after that, they just said, no, I don't want to do this. You know, they just drop their weapons and give up during that little, during that scuffle, Spartan Palmer and her, her squad are outside taking care of, all the soldier insurrectionist soldiers that have been guarding the building. Then they come blowing through the doors, but unfortunately it's too late for the rookie. Next part is their burial at sea for the rookie. Yeah. They basically do burial at sea and they're flying the, the rookie's casket out in a Pelican. You have the other four basically in the dress blues Mm -hmm. and Romeo being Romeo doesn't know when to quit basically accuses Mickey of killing the rookie because he froze and Dutch and Buck have to separate them. After that, they have some dialogue in there, which it's basically more of the same. You know, they bury the rookie Buck talks about being back on his home planet and you know, how each planet has, you know, its own smell. The water looks the waves look different on Draco three than they do on earth or anything like that. And that's what tells him is that he's home, which I thought was kind of a cool little add on on that. Dutch says I'm done at this point. Dutch is already married to a former ODST who retired after being injured. And he says, I've had enough. I'm out. So, you know, now it's just down to Mickey Romeo and buck yeah and they don't fill any of those spots before they, he gets another call back from june 
trying to recruit him for the next wave of Spartan fours. Yeah, before they leave Draco three, Buck decides to go visit his hometown, and he's sitting in sitting in the hometown bar having a drink. Lo and behold, who walks in the door? June. June. Basically, say we're starting up a new class. I would like you to join. Buck basically says, "You know my terms," and they say, "Okay." I'm, there's a lot more to that than that, but that's the basic breakdown. And I even think he gets June to have a drink. If I remember right. Yeah, but then you say that the suits just kind of like filter that out, anyways. Well, he wasn't in his suit. Well, I, he was in a suit, but he wasn't in the suit. You know, he wasn't in his Mjolnir. But. Yeah, so the whole thing with him and his terms from last time and basically the banter back and forth was June telling Buck that, yep, they are good to go for this next class of Spartans. Basically saying that, yes, we really want you (laughs) and we're willing to have them on board in order to get you in. Oh, and part of that was he also asked June, would would you have considered the rookie? And And June did say yes to that as well. So it's the second class of Spartan Force. So not, I guess, I guess there was another class since they he asked the first time. But he consulted Dare first before saying absolutely yes to it. And she's they have this whole dialogue of what's this going to do through the relationship? Can we actually have a family afterwards? And they have this whole conversation of he's asking her what, what she thinks he should do. And I think at one point she's telling him, I think you know what the answer to that is. And that's when he finally said that he's going to do the program. He's going to become a Spartan four. And then the next thing is he starts describing his augmentations. I believe so. Yeah. And this is happening on Mars is where they're doing all the, the Spartan four stuff. Yeah. After that, he travels to Mars to their training facility where he receives his augmentations and he start, he, you know, he describes in pretty good detail what they did to him. Mm-hmm. The, you know, the physical and the uh, genetic augmentations that they do to Spartans, you know, the ceramic bone implants, the better eyesight, they actually. Excruciating pain. Yeah. You know, he was like a foot taller than he was before or something like that. Right. And he describes how clumsy he is, you know, getting used to having longer legs and longer arms and the, the immense pain, uh, you know, what the bone grafting is causing and, you know, the fact that they've made him made all the bones longer. But then he talks about just how awesome he felt afterwards. Mm-hmm. After that, he basically t- he comes across saying, you know, I'm 10 foot tall and bulletproof. Yeah. That's the way he feels. And. 10 foot tall is pretty close. Probably more like seven foot tall. Well, seven foot tall, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Get your point though. After describing all the augmentations though, that's when Dare comes back in and she was like, I was waiting to tell you this, but there's a mole within your Spartan class and you need to figure this out. And she says this to him and in front of his squad mates so in front of Mickey and Romeo. No, she, no, she it tells was just him and there. then he tells he t- he, t- he, he tells, tells them. them. So there's this person that's supposedly from the uh, Unify, Unified Rebellion Front, something like that. Mm-hmm. And that through the training, he wanted, she wanted him to find out who this was to try to weed out United Rebel Front. Sorry, that's what it is. So try to, to weed out who this person was. Oh, and one thing, the person leading the Spartan 4, four program is... One of the original Spartan twos, he actually washed out of the program, Musa 096. Yep. And if I remember right, in the fuller reach, he is the one in the wheelchair. Yeah, he didn't quite make it through the augmentations, I think. Like, he got through it to where he was still alive, but it kind of left him crippled. I yeah, think I think it was something from along those lines. The way lines. they described him in the book, and the way they described him in fall of reach, and the way they've described him now... He's a lot better than he was because, <laughs> you know, before it was all he could do just to salute John. Well, they've probably come up with some medical tech since then to help him recover. But, well, I mean, look at Osman. She was one of them also crippled by the by the augmentations. And she looks like she's doing fine now. 
Yeah. If I remember right, she was actually one of them that would had to be in a neutral buoyancy tank because she was so screwed up. I don't, I don't remember for sure. I'm not even sure if they make mention, mention of it, but she was screwed up anyway. Gotcha. I just wanted to put that in there. No, that's good. But yes, Dare basically tasks Buck with finding the mole. There's only two other people that he can trust with this information because everybody else is a suspect, and that's Mickey and Romeo. So he basically tells them what's going on, and then they go into the Spartan training, which I don't even think I could watch the way they described it. They're talking about they're training, they're basically training just short of using live rounds. You know, you've heard of the beanbag shotguns and things like that. These, yeah, they're doing this, but these things are leaving marks through their, uh, let's see, they, they were in fatigues, weren't they? They weren't in any kind of body armor, if I remember right. I believe so, yes. For for the training part? Yeah. Yeah, they, were, they weren't in armor. Yeah, they weren't in any kind of body armor, you know, even ODST armor or anything like that. They were just basically in their fatigues uh, doing this. And, you know, they're getting shot with weapons. Granted, they aren't, they don't have lethal rounds, but they're powerful enough that they're leaving marks. Mm -hmm. Not just like little red dots. They're leaving like bruises. Right. And during the training, Buck is doing so poorly, which is kind of funny because he's supposed to be this, you know, you know, ultra badass ODST that he's hiding in the tunnels just so he doesn't get shot anymore. Yeah. At one point he comes across an automated shotgun and catches one right in the chest. That's going to hurt. Yeah. Just lays him out on the ground. He can't breathe. After that, they go back to their quarters and then there's an announcement that there's Spartan found. No, uh, Buck went to the infirmary because he was so beat up. They took him to the infirmary, and you know, by the time he'd got there, his he, the the Spartan enhancements had already pretty much he's got accelerated healing. By the time he got there, he was pretty much almost all back ship shape. And while he's there, they bring in a body. But didn't they say like before, like before they left, that they were like someone was missing? No, I don't believe so. I don't think anybody knew that anybody was missing until they found the body. Okay. Yeah, that is correct. And Buck, the only reason Buck knew is because he was in the infirmary when the body came in. And the way they describe this is this gurney comes in with a blood, blood soaked sheet over it. And when they describe the injuries sustained to the Spartan was basically someone had almost ripped his head off his shoulders, had pulled the tracking implants from under the skin, which were, I believe, under the jaw. Yep. So that they couldn't be found. And then, you know, they basically go into lockdown. Buck is told to go back to his quarters and stay there. They put the facility on lockdown and then a bunch, let's see, their trainer, June, Musa are, well, Musa and June are already in the mess hall and their trainer is headed there and there's an explosion. It turns out that one of the other Spartan trainees had basically had a bandolier of grenades and detonated them in the, basically the rec room slash cafeteria, I believe. The detonation happened while June was trying to get these away from them. And apparently those were tied to explosions or explosives that were around the station. And in order to counter counteract that trigger, they Musa had the station's gravity turned off. Then you have June and this other guy fighting his bandolier grenades goes off. People are coming out of their, uh, rooms trying to figure out what's going on. And then all of a sudden the, the window in the rec room lets go and June and the Spartan are sucked out into space. I did kind of jump ahead before all that. Uh, June does come to Buck's quarters, which he shares quarters with Romeo and Mickey starts 
questioning them about, you know, where were they, stuff like that, because they've had this fatality and he was found in the tunnels where Buck was hiding from the rounds. They eliminated everybody except for Buck, Mickey, and Romeo. And in their investigation, they found at the scene a necklace. And it turns out that it was a necklace that Mickey and the rookie had each bought one of these necklaces the last time they were on Luna, which was the rookie's home, the moon. They'd picked these up kind of like buddy bracelets or whatever. And since all the augmentations, Mickey couldn't wear his anymore because, you know, he'd grown so much that the chain did not fit and he just kept it in his locker. June shows the three this necklace and Mickey's like, well, that's mine. And June says, well, when's the last time you saw it? This morning when I got into my foot locker. And he says, has anybody else been in it? He says, anybody could have been in it. I, I don't even lock it. So, you know, he opens his foot locker and of course it's not in there. June basically puts them on house arrest and they are moved to a different set of quarters while they do their investigation. And then that's when all the commotion starts in the process of all that. Unfortunately, the, their trainer was killed by the loss of atmosphere because, you know, when the window blew, she was along with Buck and Romeo and several other Spartans were out in the hall and the atmosphere being blown out of the space station was actually pulling them towards that open window and Buck caught her. And when he caught her, the way she landed, it, I believe snapped her spine and it pretty much instantly killed her. So that, you know, they had that loss there. Yeah. Didn't she hit her neck on like a door frame or something like that? Something like a, a door frame or something like that. And it just, it killed her instantly. Of course they restored atmosphere or they got the window covered. Emergency shutters were closed. So that danger was over. They restored gravity. Once all the other explosive devices were disarmed and in after gravity was restored, Buck, Romeo and Mickey went back to their temporary quarters. No, they went into just an empty cabin that was right there. And Musa contacted them, said, you know, basically told them what was going on and that they were basically all cleared and they could go back to their quarters. And they were told just to leave the trainer's body in, in the room and they would be by the collector. Then from there. I think they had the discussion with Musa about the whole situation. Uh, yeah, that's when they had, yeah, they had their discussion with what, you know, what was going on. And that's when he told them, you know, about what happened with June and everything. And June survives Yay. for everybody. He's not in real good shape, but being in space without a suit can kind of do that to you. But he was able to survive because he pushed off of the other guy and came back, you know, pushed off back towards the station. So he was able to uh, survive that, which if you know about space is pretty unlikely to happen regardless. But hey, we won't go that far. Right. <clears throat> so I think the whole discussion between Musa and them was about how like the Spartan program is still there to protect the UEG, whether it's the remnant of whatever is left of the Covenant, or whether it's these rebel fighters that the Covenant war kind of stalled the whole issue between the rebels and the UEG, but it's starting to creep back up again now that the Covenant war has died out for the most part. But it's still the job of the Spartans to protect the UEG, similar as to what it was before the Covenant war even started. I think that's when we go back to... I think that's where we go back to their first mission. Yeah, their right. the first Talista. mission on Talista. And this is where they revealed that Mickey is the one that's got the gun to the, to the back of Buck's head. Mm -hmm. I think this is also where they reveal Mickey's past and how his parents were killed in an insurrectionist bombing that they actually set up. So he, his parents were insurrectionists. He had bounced around from foster home to foster home, 
to whatever and whenever he became of age, it was mandatory for him to serve in the military. And Buck is trying to understand why Mickey is doing this because Buck knows his past. So at that point, we have, um, I guess we have the whole explanation of Mickey kind of turning his back against the UNSC because of now that they're not killing Covenant anymore, they're killing humans, which he thinks is wrong and that they shouldn't be doing that even as Spartans. And he also still feels responsible for the rookie's death. That's part of it as well. Turns out that the Spartan that was planned the attack on the Spartan training space station, it was the, this basically the cells leader. It was his son, Dr. Shine. Yeah. Something like that. Shane. Turns out that this, this Spartan that betrayed all the rest of the Spartan was this guy's son. And this had been planned basically for years. It was, you know, not necessarily the Spartan Spartan part, but he was planted in the USC, UNSC military to accomplish something like this, you know, to basically go in, move up the ranks, become a trusted soldier. Probably the original plan was for him to make it into a command position or something like that to where he could, you know, make a much bigger dent in the military forces, funnel money through different channels to the insurrectionist movement or things like that. And when the Spartan four program became available, they saw a good way to strike at the heart of the UNSC at the Spartan program, which was originally started to fight the insurrectionists. Which, you know, that's a really long-term plan. Yep. All that kind of stuff takes a long time to fester, though. But that's the person who's really responsible for turning Mickey to the insurrectionists. And we find out that basically Mickey gave him that necklace to plant at the scene to make him look like a suspect to later on clear him as a suspect because in some weird way. It's basically to, because he's had this troubled past with his parents, he needed to basically have a clean bill or, you know, clean bill by, you know, seeing somebody else was the mole and you know, not Mickey. Which it worked for a bit. <laughs> yeah, it worked for a while. You know, they made it completely through the Spartan training and, you know, now they're out on missions and they've been out on several missions. They actually made it a point to try to send them on missions that, involves the covenant not humans because i believe buck had voiced concern about that to musa in one of their conversations okay somewhere anyway they were basically they in most of their missions they were sent against actual covenant forces so you know for the most part mickey romeo and buck were still fighting a covenant war just not on the same scale as they were were before. Yeah, still fighting off whatever little pieces of covenant were left. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see. The next part, they basically get Buck and Romeo up, and they're starting to march them down towards the base. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. There's a bit where, like after the re- reveal that Vicky's the one betraying them, they're starting to go down the hill towards the base where Sadie and Virgil are being held, and Romeo starts to mouth off to Mickey betraying the UNSC and and siding with the rebel forces and basically kind of accusing Romeo's being himself. Yeah. And Mickey gets fed up with it and he pushes him and Romeo starts to roll down the hill and then all the rebel guys start to chase after him. He intentionally just keeps rolling down the hill and that gives Buck the opportunity to uh, attack Mickey since they're now kind of on on one on one footing, so they get into a a brawl away from Doctor Shine, and mm-hmm. a minute or so later, when Romeo figures that okay, they're a safe enough distance away where he can engage the rebels without like Buck or Mickey getting caught in crossfire, then he he pops up and starts knocking everyone out like 
I think grabbing rocks or something and yeah, starts throwing rocks at him at at the insurrectionist guys, and he's off doing his thing, and uh, I think Buck eventually uh knocks out Mickey, and then after that's done, Doctor Sheen Sheen comes over and and threatens to kill him. I mean, he's at a distance away, so he has a pistol up at him. And then after... Actually, he has a sniper rifle at him. Was oh, it a sniper, really? Yeah. Okay. They make mention that he's he's basically... He's carrying a sniper rifle. And he's basically got the sniper rifle pointed at Buck. And at this point, Buck is... Yeah, he's knocked out Mickey. Buck was actually on the ground, faking, catching his breath. You know, he sees that Romeo's down there taking care of the rest of the rebels and Dr. Shine is trying to get Buck to order Romeo to stand down and Buck is looking for something that he can use as a weapon. He starts faking losing, you know, not being able to catch his breath and he pulls off his helmet, which, you know, initially you think the sky's got a sniper rifle pointed at your head. You don't want to be taking off your armor. But what happens is basically Buck turns and throws the helmet at him, knocks him off balance, takes the sniper rifle from him, uh, I believe knocks him out as well, and sits down and watches Romeo finish up with the Rebels. The After he's done with that, Romeo basically talks to Buck, says, you good? Buck says, fine, he's fine. Go get Sadie and Virgil. And they go through describing hearing shots and seeing flashes, you know, as uh, Romeo makes his way through the base until he finds Sadie and Virgil. And the whole time Buck is sitting there with this sniper rifle pointed at Mickey, trying not to shoot him. Right. And I believe Mickey actually wakes up after. After a few hours. Yeah. Well, yeah, they're they're still waiting for their drop shift to come pick him up. He's pretty subdued at that point, though. Not really a threat. Yeah. Basically, you know, while he's sitting there, Mickey is begging Buck to kill him, you know, while they wait for the drop ship to pick him up. They pick him up, put him in handcuffs or whatever they do, take him back to Mars Station, where Musa will, and June will now deal with Mickey. At one point, the, was it, Oni? Or, yeah, it was Oni wanted Mickey at, as a prisoner. And Musa said, no, we will take care of this. He is a Spartan. We will handle this in-house. Meaning he's going to get his <laughs> kicked. <laughs> After that, Buck requests to be reassigned to another, tr- to another team. Be, you know, Buck serving as a member not as a leader. Musa agrees to that and basically says, don't get too comfortable there. Making it seem that, okay, I'll give you this time to be just a member of a team, but I need you to lead a team. So take your time, get your affairs in order, and you just give him time to, you know, build his confidence back up. Because, I mean, having, you know, one of your trusted team members that you fought alongside with all these years it can really hurt you. you know, it really hurts you and make you doubt your decision making. And after that conversation, he calls Veronica and they talk stuff. They take a break. They take a break Thanks. for a while. And then Halo 5. <laughs> and that leads into Halo 5. Which I'm super excited to see how that whole I don't want to lead a team thing is going to happen, especially given the one of i think it was the e3 trailer where it seemed like buck was pointing a gun who's he pointing a gun at seemed like he was confronting Locke about hunting chief there's well, like think... a, these little cues that you know maybe a leader would do mm-hmm. but i think that's not just leading. yeah i think that's just the leader showing up in him like are you really sure this is a good idea type yeah comment? so i i'm, I'm like are they, is this going to come to light within Halo 5 or is this going to come to light in extended lore in the future? I would think there probably will be, at least in some part in Halo 5, 
basically Locke saying, I'm the leader of this team. You follow me type discussion. And it will probably, I would almost bet it'll probably happen probably actually a little later in the game, you know, as Buck kind of gets his confidence back. As a situation intensifies as well. True. The comment that they've shown where Buck is talking about Chief, about hunting him, and how everybody's going to hate him, you, that mm-hmm. is a that to me is totally a Buck conversation. Him looking at you and saying, this is really a bad idea. Is this really necessary? And of course, you know, Locke has his orders yeah. to find the chief for, you know, whatever reason it is, for whatever reason that the chief's gone AWOL. So I, there's going to be a pretty interesting story dynamic between Buck and Locke, I think, especially the further we get into the game. We'll find out soon enough. Oh, I can't wait. Like October's right around the corner. Only months away. Yeah. I need to get on my off my butt and get more pennies saved up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that I think will cover most of the new blood for as much of the hopping around as it did. Thanks, Godzilla, for doing most of the talking. I realized that I was not anywhere near prepared for this tonight. So apologies for that, everybody. You know, if we did miss something, feel free to call us out on it because there just so much stuff in this book that I know there's stuff that we missed and probably stuff that you guys wanted to hear us talk about. You know, if there's something, send us a message and you know, maybe we'll work it into a future podcast, do a little short thing on it, address some of those things that you wanted. Thanks everyone for tuning in on the Twitch stream for those downloading us or however you're listening to us. Thanks for just kind of listening to us and, and ramble. I guess for the most part, we will be back on Thursday for our regular time to discuss some Halo Five stuff. And yeah, we'll be actually we'll be doing two podcasts a week for the next three weeks as we lead up to RTX, uh, which is going to be pretty big for us. We have our anniversary party, our reunion party, our panel, all that good stuff happening at RTX. So if you're going to be there, we hope to see you there. If you did managed to contribute to our Indiegogo campaign. We've sent out surveys for all the perks. So make sure you answer those quickly so I can get all the stuff ordered. So if you are going to RTX, you can pick up your stuff there. And so I can ship it by the time I get back. Uh, that includes all the stuff for shirts, names for callouts on videos, podcasts, and whatnot. So make sure you get those done as soon as possible. And I guess... With that said, we'll see you guys off of our regular cast on Thursday. <laughs>